All right, so I am here to talk about statistical thinking and significance. Um, so as um, we've discussed today, doing research is a, a collaborative effort. Uh, you want to um, work with a bunch of different people, and so a statistician and a clinician aren't going to see things through the same lens. Uh, and really, in order to work together well, uh, a statistician needs to learn how the cl clinician's going to to think, and the clinician needs to learn how a statistician's going to think, uh, just so they can kind of communicate well together. And so, as just restating what we've said earlier, you should involve your statistician early and often. Um, if you come to your statistician with a research idea and sort of explain it, they will be able to do a much better job in analysis because they'll know kind of what you're expecting and what you think is going on. Um, so just to highlight a couple different perspectives, uh, a clinician's goal in research is ultimately to improve patient outcomes. So if you are looking, going back to our, our C. diff example, if you're looking at, say, levofloxacin versus ceftriaxone, seeing which one causes more infections of C. diff, you know, ultimately you would want to prescribe a, an antibiotic that doesn't cause C. diff as often if you were to, to look at those. And so the statistician's goal, however, is to effectively interpret and present data. Um, and that data would be the data that you all collect. Um, so as I said, we're going to keep using uh, our running example of antibiotic use in, in C. diff. However, you could, you could really apply this to several different research questions. Um, so oftentimes, when you think of a research question, you think it's pretty straightforward. There's two answers. There's either yes or no. That antibiotic use is going to be associated with C. diff, or it's not. Or if you are comparing to, like, say we go back to levofloxacin, ceftriaxone, you're going to say either they both cause at the same amount or they cause different amounts of C. diff. Now, statistically speaking, um, you can't say yes or no with absolute certainty. So the statistician is typically going to use null hypothesis significance testing. You all may remember this term from statistics classes if you've had them before. Uh, and so I'm going to kind of take you back to that because really that's going to frame a lot of how a statistician thinks and proceeds forward. So the statistician is going to interpret those two research questions as hypotheses. So typically your no, there's not an association is going to be the null hypothesis, whereas your yes is going to become the alternative hypothesis. Uh, and so the reason that you do that is because it's part of the hypothesis testing procedure, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but typically we're trying to disprove the null hypothesis, which you all probably remember. Um, so our null hypothesis in this example would be there's not an association between antibiotic use and C. diff infection. And so this represents what we're trying to disprove. Uh, what, we're try what we are collecting data for is we're gathering evidence against this hypothesis. Now, if we write out that there's two hypotheses, there either is or is not an association, and we have a lot of evidence against the null hypothesis, then we can say we're going to accept or we're going to reject the null hypothesis and that the alternative hypothesis is the only explanation. Um, so the alternative hypothesis being that there is an association. So a key concept in all of this is that we always assume that the null hypothesis is true when doing an analysis. Uh, and this will be important here in a little bit. Um, so as you are doing your hypothesis test, say you're doing a t-test between um, two the proportions for groups of, with uh, C. diff infection rates, what you're going to come out with is a test statistic. And that test statistic just summarizes your set of data. Um, the idea being that since there's so many factors and variables, if you reduce it down to just one number, then you can use that number to, to interpret it things. Uh, now the test statistic alone can't provide evidence for an association, so that will provide us with a p-value. Um, and I'm not going to go into huge amounts of detail of that because uh, largely time, but we will continue forward with our example. Um, 
So say we have antibiotic use in C. diff, and we find that the test for association gives us a p-value of 0 0.03. So what does this p-value mean? So in this case, you would reject the, the null hypothesis if you were using the alpha of 0 0.05. So when you're interpreting the p-value, you might have heard things such as the p-value is the probability that you got your results by chance. This is not entirely true um, because there is a condition, which I mentioned earlier, the condition being that we are assuming the null hypothesis is true when we produce this. So to a statistician, the p-value for a research question is the probability that the observed results are, um, is the probability of your observed results if there's no association between your variables. So in the case of this antibiotic use, if you have a 3% chance of saying, well, we got these results, there was a 3% chance of it happening. Um, yes. Well, by chance, but the, the lens being that if there's no association, we got a 3% chance of this happening. Not necessarily there's just a 3% chance of this happening. Um, so that is why we keep saying if there was no association. So continuing forward, if we only had just 3% chance without any sort of conditions there, then we just found rare or improbable results. So when we emphasize that there were no associations when we set up this test, then the improb improbable results emphasize that the no association part is unlikely. So all in all, the end result is that if you ask a statistician a, your research question expecting to see here yes, your statistician is, prob is going to give you an answer that's we're confident it's not no. So it's, it's a, a little bit different, um, but that's kind of the, the lens in which things are done. So going back to the if p is less than 0 0.05, um, if your p-value is less than a certain threshold, which, um, as I said, generally it's 0 0.05, then you would say you have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. And what that 0.5 or 0 0.05, excuse me, means is that is your type 1 error rate. So your type 1 error rate um, is the probability that you would detect an association when there is none. So if you think of like a, a test giving you a false positive testing for some sort of disease or um, condition, that, that would be your effectively your false positive error rate. So what that means is that for every study that has significant results, there's about a one in 20 chance that they detect an association that wasn't there because it's almost universally accepted that 0 0.05 is that cutoff. And conversely, um, if you don't have statistically significant results, you can still commit type two error, which would occur when you don't detect an association when, you, when there really is one. So that would be the equivalent of a false negative. Um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned earlier, if you have too small of sample size and you don't detect a significant difference between two groups, that what could be happening is that it could be type two error and not necessarily, um, not necessarily that there's no association. So error is always a possibility regardless of how good your results are. Uh, and it's mathematically possible to find any association or effect size that's significant. Um, so just because you find something that's significant doesn't necessarily mean that's going to be clinically useful. A good example of this would be the idea of teen pregnancy drops significantly after age 20, which of course it does because they're no longer teenagers. But so you, you may come up with, you know, as as we mentioned earlier, a 1% difference in outcome between two groups. But does that 1% difference in outcome actually, does it, is it practical? Does it actually mean anything? So that you, you should always consider the effect size of, of what you have. Um, and a p-value does not and cannot determine if hypotheses, hypotheses are literally true. It can only show evidence against a null hypothesis. Um, so just because the p-value is less than 0 0.05, that doesn't, you can, you say you have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis, but that doesn't automatically mean that, yes, 
this is 100% true 100% of the time. There's still other factors that could change things. Um, and the p-value also doesn't show you the size of your association or effect. So if you have a really small p-value, you could still have a really small effect size. Um, so if you are reporting your results, one thing you should look at um, is not only reporting the p-value. So this is a bad example, which was patients with C. diff infections are more likely to have taken antibiotics, p equals 0.02. This is a bad example. You should not do this. Um, a better example would be to say patients with C. diff infections were about five times more likely to have taken on their antibiotics. So this, at this point in time, you give your odds ratio saying that you are five times more likely to have the outcome given the exposure. But the, the best way to do it would be to include a confidence interval, which kind of shows you the, the magnitude of effect. So here, instead of just saying they're about five times more likely, we also have a confidence interval that goes from 1.33 to 12.65. So it's a pretty wide confidence interval, so you can see that there is a large degree of variability. Um, and just to cover briefly on confidence intervals, um, the, the point estimate would be the 5.02, so that would be your Typically, it's your difference or your effect size, and then the confidence interval would be represents your variability. Um, so, if you were trying to make inference from that, you'd say that there is a like if you were to look, think about what reality is after your study, um, there's a 95% chance that the true association between whatever you're studying, in this case, antibiotic use and C. diff is between 1.33 and 12.65. Um, and that there is a 5% chance that the true association is not within that confidence interval. So if you think about the type 1 error rate being 0.05%, that is the, the guiding factor. And in fact, generally, you will find that um, your confidence intervals will agree with your p-values so it's actually a little bit better to just look at confidence intervals anyway because they give you an idea of size of effect. And so in this case, an odds ratio of 1.0 would show no association. So since the confidence interval, the lowest bound is 1.33, 1.0 is not in there. And the, so we say that there is an association. Um, now, if your p-value was greater than 0 0.05, you would expect that 1.0 would be with inside your, your width of your confidence interval. And so that, just to, just to go back for a second, um, just to reemphasize that when working with a statistician, they can explain these things, and also um, if you are looking to like write up your manuscript eventually, having the statistician handle the stats part is probably the best way because they understand it the best. Um, and yeah, so does anyone have any questions?